Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. This asset, okay, has done 250% annualized for the last 10 years. And on the way to doing that, it also had, what is it then, seven drawdowns of 65% or more along the way. We've had a couple 55% down drafts. We might be having another one right now. <laughs> and then we're kicking off a completely new, you know, one to two year cycle. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined uh, by two very special guests, uh, the Dans, as they are informally known, uh, Dan Moorhead of Pantera and Tapiero of 10T. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Great to be here. All right, guys, we've got a lot of uh, really interesting content to, to cover, so I just want to dive in. Um, what I'd love to start with is just your macro framework going into 2022. I know we talked about this when we did our fireside at DAS, uh, which seems like a year ago, but it was actually only a couple months ago. Uh, maybe, Dan M., I'll pick on you to kick it off here, because you guys just led this, gr- this great Pantera uh, letter uh, at the beginning of the year, and you kind of made this analogy between what the Fed is doing and they're experiencing their wily coyote moment uh, and financial gravity is about to lock in. So why don't you explain what you meant by that metaphor and just what are the most important threads to understand uh, from a macro framework going into this next year? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's the next mega trade is the bursting of the bond bubble, specifically in U.S. government bonds and mortgage bonds. And it's something we wrote about in our November and December uh, investor letters. And it's happening. It's already started. It's amazing how it it started happening right right when we were starting to talk about it. And the way to think about it is the Fed has manipulated the long bond market to an extent that's never happened before and driven rates to really ludicrously low levels. They're basically daring people to not borrow money and buy a house. And a record number of people have taken them up on that because the Fed is essentially loaning money to Americans at 2.5% for 30 years. And if you believe that home prices are going to exceed 2.5%, it is rational to do that trade. Right now, home prices are rising at 19% per year. And so if you're borrowing at two and a half and you're making 19, it's a great trade. And that's why so many people are doing it. So there's a record number of home sales. uh, And the Fed has manipulated rates so low that the median time on the market for home sales, and this is across the entire United States, not some hot market, but this is every single home in the United States is under one week. That's crazy. I mean, that is not a healthy market. Um, And so uh, all, you know, Ponzi schemes are stopped by something from the outside. They're never the Ponzi scheme manipulator that that stops it. And it's called Senator Manchin. And the 6.7% CPI print is what stopped this one. And I think the Fed is uh, realizing that they're just so far out over their uh, wily coyote moment where they've been just walking across air for months when it's it's been super obvious to me that the the Manipulation in the bond market is counterproductive. It's terrible for most citizens in America and that they have to stop. But financial gravity doesn't lock on until something from the outside comes. It just happened. I think the Fed is going to be reversing course at a rapid rate. And, and I think rates are going to double in the United States. I mean, it's, this is a huge trade. Uh, and we can talk about the scale of it. Um, but there's $10 trillion of market cap, I think, that will unwind in the bond market. I mean, I think it... You know, that makes sense. I look to me, the difference between zero and one and two on the Fed funds rate is immaterial uh, in uh, the analysis I do as to where I'm going to allocate capital. Um, the real interest rates in the U.S. are minus seven. Dan just mentioned that 6.7 CPI. So let's just call it minus seven percent real rate. That's the most negative real rates have been, uh, I think, on record, uh, certainly in the last 70 years. Um, It's going to take a very, very long time for the Fed to implement restrictive policy. Um, And I I mean, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. Um, Look, we wiped out about $10 trillion in equity market cap globally, probably in the last you know, a few weeks. That's the tightening, right? 
I don't think the, the, the equity market is going to do the tightening ahead of the Fed for the Fed. So I'm not really a big believer in rates really going anywhere just because um, the gross debt outstanding is just too high. And, you know, I do think uh, economies do slow much more quickly than they have before. Um, so they may rates in, in, you know, may double as Dan is saying, but in my worldview, that takes six, seven, eight years. Doesn't, it's not going to happen uh, in a year or two. Um, but that's just, you know, that's just my view. I don't, I think the equity market, uh, will, will, will lead this thing and the amount of liquidity being destroyed. I mean, we lost, uh, almost a trillion in, in crypto market cap, uh, and only 2% of the world own crypto. So, you know, that has zero impact on global economies. Um, you know, maybe we lost even more than 10 trillion. So, uh, I just, I, I still think we're in a pretty big uh, bull um, for assets uh, because the real rate is just too negative. Um, you know, the one thing I would look at in some bigger picture, what, what would make me concerned, uh, I remember in early 2000, the two-year note was 6% and CPI was three. So we had a 3% real rate, positive real rate, all right? When we start to have a positive real rate, and that can mean anything, that can mean CPI at one and Fed funds at two, all right? That would be 1% real rate. When we, when we get to a 3% real Fed funds rate or 2%, you know, then I'll start being concerned about the, the bigger picture. Otherwise, I just think this is a uh, cleansing of the froth and, uh, you know, you can't have you know, fintech companies trading at, you know, 80 times revenue. I mean, it's just crazy. So uh, this is sort of a much welcome uh, correction in my view. And I think this year is going to be volatile. We're going to have lots of up and down. My guess is net net at the end of the day, we probably can still do better in the equity market. I mean, but again, I'm not really focused on equities and I'm frankly not really focused at much in the legacy world. Uh, I just don't think you know, I mean, Dan, you can back me up on it. I just don't think it's very interesting compared to what's going on in, you know, the crypto Bitcoin blockchain world. Dan, I, Dan T, I kind of fall into your camp of negative real rates, because on the one hand, I understand that we're probably heading towards an environment of secular inflation, right? A lot of whatever reason you want to assign to it, right? Let's call it the M2 number, the amount of money that's been created over the course of last year. Let's call it uh, supply chain bottlenecks. Let's call it the rising cost of energy. Let's call it geopolitical tensions and reshoring of supply chains. Whatever you want to say, it does seem like there are a lot of macro forces stacking up in the inflation camp. On the other hand, if you look at debt to GDP, you know, debt to GDP is like over 130% in the United States, right? If you rewind the clock back to 2018, you know, Powell did try to raise rates and he got somewhere, right? But around two and a half percent or three percent, you know, the stock market started to implode and we got the famous Powell pivot. So I guess my question to you guys is, A, how much leeway do you think the Fed really has in this big game that they're talking now of raising interest rates and tapering their balance sheet and all that kind of stuff? And, and if we're headed towards that environment of secular inflation, do you see negative sustained real, rate, real rates, I suppose? I, I love the fact you used the word secular. I think it's so important because um, I'm not one of these you know, hyperinflation is nine nuts that have been saying that for like 20 years. I made my whole career on being long bonds. I've been long since I met Dan 30 years ago, right? Like it's been a secular decline in inflation and a secular decline in overnight rates globally. Uh, I was in Japan when they invented ZERP, zero interest rate policy. Everyone copied them. We've had zero interest rates basically everywhere for a long time. That's why I'm so excited about this trade of being short bonds because this is a new and like Dan said six to eight year trend this is a huge new trade uh, and the fun thing is there's a lot of people that have never been in that environment right like they've never seen inflation they've never seen the Fed do a real tightening you know I agree with Dan that whether the Fed goes from one to two doesn't really change my bullishness on cryptocurrencies right like that's it that's a sideshow and really interesting to talk about but I think they're going to five or six, right? Like, I think people have no clue how high uh, rates are going. And there's a lot of people that have never seen a 6% Fed funds rate, right? And so it's, it is it is coming, but it is a huge secular thing. And um, it's going to take a lot to slow down 
the economy. And the, and the, the, the point on the, the bond bubble is there is no other buyer of bonds. Like it's only the Federal Reserve that's buying bonds. There's no, you know, rational, independent, private party that's buying bonds. So when they stop, it will be this just discontinuous drop. Whereas equities, you know, there's a ton of free market people buying and selling equities, you know, so I don't really have a strong opinion on equities. You know, maybe the Fed goes to 5% and equities, you know, stay where they are. I, I don't know. But the one thing I do know is when the Fed is, is stopped from manipulating the market, there is no other buyer. There's nobody else on earth that wants to loan people money for 30 years for 2.5%, right? That's just insane. So um, that the bond market is the real problem, not the equity market. I, I look at these two worlds. I mean, I, I look at the sort of legacy fiat world, and then I look at the new DAE, I call, keep calling it digital asset ecosystem. So that's everything in that world. And over the last 10 years, the S&P 500 has gone down 99% against Bitcoin, okay? It's gone down 99% against Ethereum. It's gone down 99% against almost any of the, the decent cryptocurrencies. You know, Raul Powell and I used to talk about this. He was very into this whole concept of a, a default, right? We're going to have a default at some point. So I, and I've always said, we're never going to have a default. The legacy fiat system is manipulated. It will continue to be manipulated. It will not trade freely. And so I'm not really sure that interest rates get to what would be a rational macro you know, place where, I mean, a, a place where you would think it would go doing traditional macro analysis. What I think happens and I think is happening is that you get a devaluation of the entire legacy fiat world against this new DAE. And again, you have stable coins yielding 8%. You got Bitcoin yielding six to eight. I think that there is going to be an exodus of capital from the manipulated legacy fiat world into the DAE. And we've moved from 300 billion in market value of the whole ecosystem two years ago to three trillion. Uh, now it's probably two, two and a half. Um, you know, of course I, I named my fund 10T because back when it was 300 billion, I, I thought we're going to 10 trillion. I'm gonna to be totally wrong about that. It's gonna to go to 30 trillion. We talked about this the last time we all talked. And so I think it's possible that uh, you get this exodus and those markets continue to be um, manipulated because frankly, you know, a 5% interest rate, uh, I, I think just kills too many people in that old world. And there are old people in that old world. The people who own the bonds, the people who own the equity, they're all old people and they're boomers and pensioners and, you know, all these pension. I mean, so I just don't see that world. I don't believe in the hard default, the, you know, soup, uh, you know, kitchen and bread line whole thing. And Raul got into that for a while. Uh, I just think it's a slow exodus of capital into what I think are really the only truly free markets in the world. Uh, Bitcoin to me is the most liquid you know, a true free market. It is not manipulated by any central authority, by any large people talk about the whales. There's no whale that's going to, you know, <laughs> manipulate Bitcoin down 30%. It's, you know, maybe eight, nine years ago. And I could speak to that. Dan could. could. So to me, I, I sort of, I changed my analytical framework away from the one that I've used for 25 plus years coming from, you know, that old, you know, macro hedge fund world, because I see something new that's grown up um, that is so attractive. Uh, I just think people aren't aware of the yields and returns that uh, they're aware of the returns broadly, but they think it comes with an enormous amount of risk. You can lend to those people taking enormous risk and earn eight, nine percent in what I think is a pretty secure fashion. So. Um, I think that the DAE will pull, last thing I'm going to say, will pull away money. Uh, if you want to, you know, get into Dan M's framework, um, you know, a source of capital for the bond market, if you believe his, his frame in that framework is not uh, that capital, I think will be floating more into the DAE away from 
that bond market, like historically that yield searching capital would have moved into that bond market. So uh, it, it certainly, you know, lends some credence to, to his view. You no, know, I, I think it's a great way to say it is that, you know, bonds have basically been in a 30 year bull market. That's over. We're going the other way. And then equities, um, you know, as I said before, I'm a little more, you know, open to them, you know, being fairly valued because the independent parties have been trading them. But I think that the the uh, punchline of all this is we're, we're going to find out that the existing asset classes and definitely bonds are not a great place to invest your capital. And people will be looking for more uncorrelated, diverse, you know, uh, strategies and blockchain is the only three trillion dollar answer to that question, right? Like if you're looking to put some money to work, you know, timber or something like that, it's not going to be able to, you know, uh, really put trillions of dollars to work. So I do think that you're going to see a very short period where people consider crypto a highly correlated risk off kind of asset like it's been in the last, you know, six weeks. Uh, but in history, uh, there have been six big downdrafts in the S&P while Bitcoin's been trading and Bitcoin's been highly correlated for 70 days and then the correlation breaks down and it goes and does its own thing. And, and I think that's probably what's happening here is that there's this kind of knee jerk reaction. Oh, the Fed's raising rates. The world's coming to an end. We got to sell bonds. We got to sell stocks and we got to sell crypto. I think in a couple of months, people are going, huh, maybe that's backwards is we got to sell bonds. We got to sell stocks, but you got to invest in something and the something is crypto. And so I think pretty quickly the bond, the markets are going to decouple and you could easily see bonds and equities getting killed in 2022 and crypto being up huge. And that's, you know, I think it's pretty likely uh, to happen. And you know, I listened to this interview that you guys did a couple of years ago, back in 2019, you were talking about how, you know, back when you guys were first getting started, there was a huge demand to search for uncorrelated sources of return, right? But then because of modern portfolio theory, actually a lot of things because of the commonality of owners and leverage, right? These like uncorrelated assets actually ended up becoming very correlated. So one thing that might be a little bit uh, different this time in between past crypto bull runs is that I don't want to say it's an institutional asset class yet. I don't think it is, but there's certainly more institutional holders and there's definitely more institutional holders of, let's say, Bitcoin. So how much do you assign the price action to that commonality of ownership and maybe some of the leverage that they're taking out on some of the larger assets like Bitcoin and maybe ETH? You know, someone said uh, I, this is the CNBC really line, which you know, oh, over the weekend, you couldn't hedge with anything and because uh, it was closed, so people sold Bitcoin. And I mean, to me, honestly, it's all just a bunch of nonsense. Uh, I mean, seriously, I, you know, the world of trading for ticks and, you know, these hedge funds trying to make 10% a year, I, I just, I, I, I just don't understand it. So I'm not really engaged, risk on, risk off. I mean, this nonsense has been discussed like this for the last 15 years. That's not an investment strategy. That is not a wealth building uh, exercise. I, I don't know what that is. It's just legacy, you know, people stuck in the legacy world needing to push, you know, paper around. And I hate to, to be so demonstrative about it, but I mean, you know, I think last time Dan M said something, I recall now he's like, Dan, you know, dollar yen, was is 113 today and it was 113 25 years ago when we were a tiger and I'm like yeah it was so like weren't we the dopey ones doing macro when we could have just been long you know the s p in 92 right or 93 whatever so uh and many of our of course you know all those tiger guys of course that they were and they have been and um so i just I, you know I, I just think that um I, I think a lot about, you know, where are you, you're going to make the greatest return over the next sort of five to seven years. That's kind of my, my outlook, right? And uh, this day-to-day -day price action is just, uh, and I don't know, you know, risk on recall. I just, it, it doesn't compute for me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, I agree with Dan. That there's this desire for pundits to explain what already happened in the past in a nice culprit to trot out as the increased institutional ownership of, of blockchain. I, that is not what happened, in my opinion, that if you think about it, you know, endowments and foundations are actually engaging and, you know, we're seeing a lot of them come into our, our new fund that we're raising right now. 
But the punchline of the whole thing is none of them are selling. It's not like, oh, you know, we've got 40 basis points in blockchain and it went down 20%. So we're going to stop the whole program and sell everything. No, they're, they're just at the beginning of their investment process. It's going to take them a decade really to, to I think in the long run, it's going to be like seven or 8% of everybody's portfolio, right? And so if you're an endowment or foundation, you got 40 basis points, you're not, you know, you are not selling definitely. So it, the, the down pressure on crypto is certainly not from institutions selling. You know, it's just the usual greed and fear. And it's you know, just trading. Panicking. I mean, look, it's just trading. This asset, okay, has done 250% annualized for the last 10 years. And on the way to doing that, it also had, what is it then, seven drawdowns of 65% or more along the way. Uh, you're not going to make 250 annualized, in, you know, and this is in Bitcoin, uh, without sitting through a lot of volatility. And that's just the nature of it. Uh, this isn't for everybody, right? That, that's fine. Um, but if you're an entrepreneur, if you're someone who wants to be engaged on, you know, in the future, uh, in a new system that is certainly freely trading, that is not manipulated, um, I, I tell you, I, you know, I, I, it's certainly the biggest um, macro event, uh, you know, so, uh, certainly of my career, but it probably, you know, going back, I mean, at least till the war. I mean, World War II. It's the only global, global macro trade. Yeah. Let's kind of transition into talking about crypto and where we are in the cycle and your views on crypto, I suppose, going forward. Um, maybe to start with a little bit of a revisitation of the past, uh, Dan M., in that, in Pantera's letter, there was a great comparison in between the 2017 uh, crypto bull run and kind of the bull run today that may or may not still be going. So I'd love to kind of, if you could just kind of summarize your thoughts on comparing those two, two different periods of time, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, we just put it out in our letter, which is on our website, a cool graphic that shows the market composition in the 2017 versus today. Totally different. So only six of the top 20 currencies at that time are still in the top 20. And the average position of the other 14 is number 90. So an amazing cycling of things. And then uh, I think it's 11 or 13 or so of the new top 20, didn't even exist in 2017. So we've just had this enormous dynamism of, of creativity. So uh, the thing that is kind of fascinating is the uh, Bitcoin dominance or the percentage of the total market cap that's Bitcoin is exactly the same as it was then. It was 39% then, it's 39.40 right now. Uh, but in the intervening time, a year ago, Bitcoin dominance was 70%. So we've seen this huge cycle of 2017 was all about kind of Layer one Bitcoin competitors, you know, ETH competitors that don't really, you know, resonate anymore. Uh, and then all those got crushed and then it was all Bitcoin a year ago. And then now we're in this new world where there's huge amount of value in DeFi and other tokens built on other um, uh, protocols. So, um, you know, so the world did change quite a bit. The thing I like to keep <laughs> reminding people is the price of Bitcoin. Dan mentioned has historically gone up 2.5x for 11 years, uh, pretty consistently. It's only like 50 percent higher than it was at the end of 2017. I was saying that just before, I was like, guys, it's too cheap. It was 20,000 January of 18. Four years later, it's 35. I mean, it's a joke. It's really way. No, so I really, I'm there. I'll admit there have been some bear markets where I was sweating. You know, like I was like, oh, maybe blockchain's not going to work. Maybe Bitcoin's you know, a failure. I'm mega bullish right now. And I think people are just panicking and this will be seen as a great time to invest uh, because, you know, we really are just barely up from where we were, um, you know, uh, in 2017. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast growing crypto native funds, crypto banks, exchanges and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal, which automatically plugs into exchanges, trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day -day crypto transactions all the way down to complex 
DeFi strategy. And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry-leading technology. Doesn't matter if you're a two-person crypto fund or a 2,000-person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. We're probably all, I would say, mega bullish uh, on this chat. I certainly am too. Um, But in terms of uh, crypto right now, um, the price action doesn't look super good, to your point. You could paint that in a very bullish light. But I guess the question that I would ask to you guys is, do you think we're still in a bull market, uh, right? Because you could kind of go either way at this point. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's not the same characterization as, you know, NASDAQ at 20% correction or whatever. This has done 7, 65 or more percent corrections and still it's still been in a bull market since inception. It's, mm. In fact, it's probably the greatest bull market in the history of all markets. So, uh, you know, I do think, you know, you got a hold. Um, one thing that is different this time, and Dan can correct me because he's been around a lot longer in this space than me, but this is a bull market that's led uh, to me by Ethereum and increased number of use cases and what I call a broadening and deepening of the digital asset ecosystem. And I think part of that bull market is driven by, you know, last year, the Bitcoin guys were really riding the Ethereum guys. You know, oh, you have infinite supply, Ethereum's not real, blah, 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 blah. So they decided to like cut back the supply, which I thought was totally unnecessary. Um, it, you didn't really need to do it. If you'd had enough conviction in your work and Ethereum was phenomenal. And I, you know, it's incredible what that thing is. But they still had a little chip on their shoulder, those guys. And so they decided to cut back the supply and they're burning Ethereum. So what happens, of course, the Ethereum supply is reduced. The price goes up a ton. The gas fees explode. And then all of a sudden that leaves room for these new guys like Solana uh, and Matic to come in and, you know, take, I don't want to say take, but to focus on specific parts of what was the Ethereum ecosystem, a focus and and grow. And I'll tell you, I think it's super healthy that, you know, that Vitalik and the Ethereum group, I guess that's consensus really, that they don't mind that. They're, they, they're, I think they even sort of encourage people to build on top of them as long as they're gonna settle at the end of the day uh, to the Ethereum blockchain. I think it, it's great that they're in, uh, encouraging in a way all these new uh, use cases, but I, I do think, you know, for the new chains, but I do think that um, uh, it almost, I don't want to say happened by mistake, but it's almost like they got bullied into their own bull market in, in a way. So, um, yeah, and as Dan mentioned, look, uh, the creativity and intellectual firepower and people moving from the legacy world into this digital asset ecosystem. I mean, it's the, I think it's the smartest, you know, most productive, uh, you know, most creative entrepreneurial people. I think you're spot on. And, you know, Michael, your question about are we in a bull market still, you know, Dan's right to zoom out. We're in a 25 year bull market. So like that's one answer. But um, there is a, you know, a cycle that's a couple of years typically in, in Bitcoin. There's definitely a cycle around the four year halvings that uh, we've written on a ton. And in our research, we think it starts about 450 days before the halving and it ends about 420 after. And so we titled our investor letter in September, a new price cycle, because I think we kind of did the whole halving thing. It did pretty much what was expected. And then that was until basically April of last year. And then we've been in this kind of confused new era. Uh, We've had a couple 55% down drafts. <laughs> we might be having another one right now. Uh, and then we're kicking off a completely new, you know, one to two year cycle. And, you know, I, I just think that's the way to think about it is that, you know, obviously on a secular basis, we're going way up. We're in this huge, you know, 25 year bull market. But, you know, we're going to have these two year, one, two year, you know, kind of uh, bull and bear cycles. And, you know, I think we're just grinding through 
the new one that's defining the next big trade, the next big move. I think there's something a little different about this, and that is that um, I think it's very hard to know what part uh, of this world sort of it, it leads leads it. Meaning, 18 months ago there were no NFTs. Okay, it is possible that. You know, I, I've never seen anything in the space adopted as quickly by the traditional people as NFTs. In the last two months, you've had every large, you know, Fortune 500 company, I mean, everybody, Adidas, everybody coming out and has to have an NFT strategy. Uh, it, it's, you know, we've had Bitcoin for 12 years and, and, and you don't hear people coming out saying, oh, I need a Bitcoin strategy, right? Or I need an Ethereum strategy. So, you know, the way I approach this world is a little different from Dan uh, in the sense that I don't have quite the skill set to focus on some of the earlier stage uh, protocols and companies. My, my great fear is to not capture the increase in the value of the DAE to that 30 trillion number from 3 trillion. And part of the reason for that is that I can't tell where the future will go like two three years from now i don't know what part of the ecosystem will be the driver will be dominant um and you know last thing i'm going to say i'll let dan talk about this for a second but you saw that debate between and i wrote about this in our investor letter uh you see this debate between uh dorsey who's sort of bitcoin only guy and andreessen and the silicon valley guys you know, multi-chain, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to myself, those are the two, probably two of the smartest guys of my generation, uh, most successful, super brilliant off the charts, and they have opposing views. And I say in my letter, that should scare the hell out of you as an investor, because those guys are the best there is, and they don't agree. And so one of them may be right, one of them, they both may be wrong. I don't know. But what I know is that that future two years from now, three years from now, may be about something that we don't even know about today. So I need to own the companies that are making hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in revenue today, because those are the, in the space, because those are the companies that will have the ability to pivot to that unknown future. Last thing, I'm sorry. And we saw that this year, for instance, with Kraken, which is a company we own and we bought in January, there was no staking at Kraken in January. They're making a huge amount of money. Jesse pivoted. All of a sudden, their staking business is a massive revenue contributor this year. And so the way that I, in a way, that hedge, but the way that I sort of risk manage against all of those possible futures that I am unaware of, is by building a portfolio the way uh, 10T is. I'm sorry if that's like a, a plug, but it's, it's not really. It's sort of how I approach this whole space. You can see me smiling here because I, I have so many thoughts on what you guys are talking about. I, Dan M, to go back to that, I agree with you. I think the bull market actually peaked back in April, and we've basically been doing sideways chop ever since. And for me, like when you look at previous... Well, wait a second, wait a second, Mike. One part of this space peaked in April. There are many things that were hitting all time highs in October, November, December. Uh, in, I mean, like even during this sell off we've had now, these punks have been very strong. I mean, now I know Dan M is watching the punks and the, uh, and the apes, apes and all of that stuff very closely. I so I, I'm totally with you. I'm just saying, it, 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 if you look at the market cap in general, it's kind of traded in a range since then. And I am a believer that you need a strong Bitcoin for the strong rest of the crypto market. Uh, so if you look at past bull runs, crypto as an asset class has returned like what it, like a thousand x, you know, in that 2011, 800 x in 2013. We've only done a 25 x really, and that's like big bunny years, but only. So I'm wondering if the bear market on the other side of that looks very different. And Dan T, to your point about what are interesting things, I think something that happens in crypto is that the the most hypey crappy uh, part of the bull cycle ends up being the innovation that the next bull run is built on. So like ICOs in 2017, right? That was like super hypey. We all kind of knew it was a bubble. It was, it was a little ridiculous. But that fundamental innovation, bootstrapping growth by selling ownership of a network, 
That's what led to DeFi, and that kind of led to NFTs as well. So I think it's it's really interesting, Dan T, that you call out the what's going on in NFTs, because even as ETH is falling, NFT prices are still kind of holding, which I find really interesting. And the all these companies coming out and being like, oh, the metaverse is the next big thing. Look, when Walmart comes out and says the metaverse is the next big thing, that's like, <laughs> they're kind of killing the narrative right there. It's like dead as a doornail. But in two years, <laughs> right? Like that probably means... the. That's directionally correct, I would say. I don't know if you guys have thoughts. That was my spiel. I think you're spot on is that every kind of creative explosion, whether it was ICOs in 2017 or dot com in 99 or whatever, it's easy to kind of make fun of the dumb projects that didn't work, but massively important things came out of it. Um, and uh, one of my favorites is I, I had an interview uh, or actually debate with one of the rarest animals on earth, a supposedly smart person who's negative on Bitcoin. And it's this academic at Johns Hopkins that um, super negative, just always spewing hugely negative stuff. And on the way to the studio on CNN, I read his paper and it was called Bitcoin, the pets.com of our era. And it was a fun debate because he didn't know who the dope was that was the majority owner of pets.com. Almost no one does, and it's my favorite. It's this guy who thought the internet was going to be really transformative, and you know, obviously selling pet food on the internet didn't work. But selling books was fine, and Jeff Bezos is doing great, even though he was the dope who was the Pets.com owner. And that's basically the way I look at all these things. Um, the, I was in a, a, a group lunch with a bunch of investors, and one of the guys was pretty heated about the ICO bubble, and he was like, it was a total disaster using some more colorful language and all that stuff. And I'm like, no, it was awesome, right? Our our fund, which used to be called the ICO fund, now it's called the <laughs> token fund, is up 25x, right? Like, it was great. You know, it just, you had to be in the right things, you know? And that's the same with NFTs. 95% of what's being bought today is going to go to zero. Definitely. But, man, the stuff that's that's going to, you know, change art and change a lot of things is is really important. So, you know, that's the perspective people have to have. So there's going to be some dumb ideas, there's some failures, but amongst all that, incredibly important things are, are coming yeah, out. I mean, just the speed of adoption. I mean, like Dan, and you've been in the space so long. I mean, aren't you surprised? It seemed like the corporate guys, like the very buttoned up corporate companies, glommed on to NFTs within like two months. Um, I mean, I mean, what do you attribute that to? It's just because they, they haven't really even, you know, they perked up a little bit to, you know, crypto blockchain, but not not the way they have to this. Well, I think NFTs are awesome for our industry because they're accessible and yeah, fun, fun, right? Yeah. Like getting a like hugely complicated wallet to store is very yeah, it's in your background, right? You don't you have really to work. understand the white yeah. paper that's behind you to understand, you know, and then after that. and that's what that's why they're that's why they're popular. It's like you don't have to know how SHA two fifty six works to think you want to buy an NFT, right? Like, and so I think it's going to bring a huge amount of people into our space. You know, five percent of them are ultimately going to get super involved and really understand how polka dot works or whatever. But you know, most are just having fun. They're giving each other gifts. You know, and so that's why companies are involved because they yeah. see it's you know it's engaging their potential customers, right? I have a question for you guys. So let's let's talk about that uh, that debate between Jack and Jack Dorsey and Mark. Um, I, I don't think that's actually an isolated incident, right? You've actually seen a couple of instances recently about like huge pushback from traditional, let's say, Web two communities or Web two founders, right? So there was an exchange between Brian Chesky and the founder of Box, where they're like kind of going back and forth and making fun of, uh, oh, everyone's just going to weigh in on every decision. And like, there's no, you know, central, you know, they're kind of mocking it. Right. Um, and then you've also seen, you know, the founder of, uh, uh, what was it? you know, Signal was going to roll out Ethereum, which I was like, wow, that's, uh, or Discord, sorry, Discord was going to roll out. It's like, oh my God, this is going to be a slam dunk. They're going to own this huge part and huge pushback from the community, from the gaming community. They're like, we don't want these NFTs. What do you guys make of it? I have a, a personal pet theory about it, but I'd love to understand how do you guys see these debates and this like, emotional response that's happening. Well, I think that is what's fascinating, that especially for Bitcoin maximalists, it's so emotional. Like it really is more than just a trade or a position or whatever. It's almost like a religion or a philosophy or something like that. Um, and, you know, while Bitcoin's amazing, it does its one use case really well. I think Dan's point 
there's a lot of use cases, right? There's so many. We're just discovering new ones like NFTs. Gaming's the next huge one. Billions of people want to use that use case. And then there's going to be, you know, things we haven't even thought of yet, right? So I think it's it got to be a multi-chain world, right? Like there's just so many different things that blockchain can improve. And although Bitcoin is really, really good at some things, it's not great at other things, right? So I think that one's pretty pretty obvious. And the other really obvious one is the Web3, you know, is coming. Like all these centralized data monopolies, they're they're pretty bad for a lot of people, right? right. Like they are, they definitely, you know, motto do no evil. I, some of them do a lot of evil, right? Like, and um, if you have cooperatively owned, cooperatively governed protocols, they just got to be better, right? And, you know, everybody talks about governance. There's companies like Facebook that literally have no governance, just one guy. He gets to pick, you know, should I sell false information? Yeah, sure. You know, should I destabilize democracy? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Whereas the community would make different decisions. And when the people want to rag on that, like, yeah, maybe they don't always make a perfect choice, but I think the collective wisdom of the crowd would be way better than a profit maximizing single individual, right? Like, you know, it's just, and it's going to take a decade, right? It's not going to happen overnight that we're not going to have, you know, decentralized social network take over tomorrow, but it will take over. Like to my mind, Web3 is like the most obvious thing ever. Um, again, take it's going to take a decade, but it is definitely coming and it's going to be better for the content producers, Yeah, better for mental health. All these things are going to be so much better. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. I'm a little more Bitcoin centric maybe than Dan, just because I'm like just I can't get away from being like such a deep macro guy. And also, remember, I'm a gold guy too. I've got my physical gold business. Uh, it's, you know, I had a record year last year. I mean, you know, all the people in the Bitcoin were, ah, gold is crap and this and that. Uh, you know, we've got 15 different business lines. The business is humming. I mean, I'm not engaged, involved with the day to day, but of course I'm on the board. I still own a big piece of it. So, um, that store of value money, the moneyness is super important to me. And there's nothing in this world without Bitcoin. So there's no Bitcoin going away. If there's no Bitcoin, there's no digital asset ecosystem. There's nothing. I don't, I mean, I, I know that maybe people have different views on that multi chain, this, that, whatever, forget it. If there's no Bitcoin is it at the core. And to me, it's true collateral. So I don't know what the percentage of dominance or whatever it is, is going to be. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that, and I also, I also do believe in some of the philosophical aspects of it. And I think they are important. So again, maybe that's more my gold background, um, that, that has me focus on Bitcoin, but at the same time, and again, I'm not a technologist. I do see all of these sort of VC technology, I call them projects, right? All these new protocols, they're VC tech projects. They're not, they're not, maybe some of them will become money. Ethereum uh, could certainly be, have a moneyness to it. Um, but, uh, you know, you don't just pop up all of a sudden after, you know, in two years and, and become something that's dominant. So I have a little more room for the, you know, Bitcoin, you know, till the end kind of mentality, but at the same time, would never want to squelch the innovation and creativity of all these, you know, super genius computer coder guys and mathematicians, etc., who are in the space. Hey, Dan, here's a gold thought experiment for you. Can you imagine a world before Bitcoin where you would tell somebody like you who's, you know, positive on gold that the Federal Reserve was going to print nine trillion dollars of free money? The Congress would literally hand checks to everyone in America, whether they needed it or not. Inflation would go to a 40 year record. And we didn't even mention that doesn't include the real cost of housing. Owners equivalent rent and CPI now since 1982 is this number that's only up 3.1% over the last year, which is totally obviously wrong. So we, we really do have double digit inflation if you counted it the correct and or 1970s way. And gold would go down 4% last year. People would have bet anything against that. And that's Bitcoin taking market share from gold, right? Digital gold. But hold on a second. 
gold, as I say this every time I talk about it, gold never does what you think it should do. You know, it never does uh, when you think it should do it, right? So in 2015, I think gold was around 1,200, okay? It's 1,800 today. So it's gone up 50% in 10 years. That's terrible com compared to a whole bunch of things. Um, but you know, gold could go up 30% this year. And all of a sudden, you know, it's corrected some of its underperformance. But it is the hardest thing to trade, uh, you know, in that sense, because things get discounted very quickly. I actually think, and I put this out on Twitter, gold is on the verge of like a major breakup to the upside. And I wrote in this tweet, I said, wouldn't it be just hysterical? Gold only rallies after the 7% CPI print. Like people, there's no more hated an asset at the moment. It, there's no more unloved an asset. Everyone is saying, this is performed like crap when I thought it was gonna do great. And I'm just looking at it. And I think if you break 1950, you're gonna head up and make new highs and go above 23 to 2400. I wanna say one thing. One thing that I, I, I have gotten wrong in a sense is that I expected, I still think gold is the best hedge for the legacy system. It is the best legacy system hedge. So Bitcoin is not really a hedge for the stocks in your portfolio. Bonds are not gonna work anymore like they did for those 30 years, you know, every time you have a recession or things slow down. If things slow down now, let's just say, uh, the, there really is nowhere for the rates to go in a sense. So they're not, the bonds are not gonna offset any losses uh, or any return that you might've expected in, in the equities. Um, but gold could, I think gold, has an ability to replace bonds as the hedge in a traditional, certainly a traditional 70-30 uh, portfolio. Um, and institutions own no gold. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a view, there is a worldview that some of those institutions, and I've spoken to quite a few of them, they're, they're, they're gonna come to Bitcoin eventually. They're not there yet, but they're sitting on 20, 30% of bonds that aren't a productive asset class. And so I've been wrong about this so far, but if I'm trying to think about, if I'm right about this 1950 to 2300, what could get us there? It just might be, you know, that, that the bonds are selling off like Dan thinks, the equities aren't producing your return, and maybe the Fed, you know, I don't know, has to reverse, right? And things slow and, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 again, it's just a, a, a potential framework. I, I'm trying to figure out whether Dan is right and what he's suggesting is that gold's never going to rally ever again. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm absolutely gutted because we've got to cut it here. I've got so many more questions for the two of you that we didn't get to. So maybe in the future we can do a, a round two or something like that. But in the meantime, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, congratulations, both of you, to the success of you know, 10T and Pantera. Uh, it's inspiring to watch. Uh, if folks want to find out more about you, read any content that you're putting out, uh, what's the best way to do that? For us, PanteraCapital.com, we have all of our material up there, and we publish an investor letter monthly. Yeah, 10TFund.com, pretty much the same thing. I, I don't know that we put our investor letter uh, on our website. Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> It's so involved, but I mean, Dan, uh, Dan's letters are phenomenal. So er everybody should be, should be reading them. Great. Um, all right, guys. Well, thanks. That's all the time we have for now. I appreciate you so much coming on the podcast. We'll catch up soon. Cheers. Thanks.